Hey, what's going on, AP World people? We are back with video number two. This one is on Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So let's get started. So Judaism is a monotheistic religion which believes in one God, Yahweh. The Hebrew scriptures are part of the Christian Old Testament, so there's some similarities between Judaism and Christianity. And Canaan was founded by Abraham in 2000 BCE. So we're going way back in time here. This is present-day Israel, Palestine, and Lebanon. And the Hebrews went to Egypt where they were enslaved. And Moses will lead the Hebrews out of Egypt in 1300 BCE. And the Ten Commandments were introduced by Moses, which play an integral part in Judaism and Christianity. So some conquering of Jewish states you should be familiar with. Jewish people are conquered and forced to disperse or leave their areas. First group is the Assyrians. They conquered Israel in 722 BCE. The Babylonians conquered the kingdom of Judah in 586 BCE. And Jews were able to return in 539 BCE. I know we're going way back in time here, but this is important when we get to more modern day history of Judaism, which we'll talk about towards the end of the course. Now the Romans also conquered Jewish states and they did so in 37 BCE. They were going to take over Jerusalem and the Jews will rebel in the early centuries common era or CE. Rome will win. However, they will persecute Jews and this will force many Jews to flee their homes and land around Jerusalem. So they will be forced to disperse or leave their homes. Jumping over to the impact of these conquests of Jewish states. Well, we have a growth of a Jewish diaspora communities around the Middle East and the Mediterranean. Please underline or circle for me Jewish diaspora. This means people are leaving their land. Jumping over to Christianity, the core beliefs are Jesus was the Son of God, it's monotheistic, and salvation could be attained for all believers. And this is equality for all believers. And it drew on the beliefs of Judaism, particularly the Old Testament. And another core belief of Christianity is caring for the poor. So early Christian converts included artisans, traders, women. Saint Paul was a major figure in early Christianity. He set up communities in present day Turkey. And Armenia is going to be the first country where Christianity became a state religion. And this will help propel other states to have Christianity become a state religion as well. So the spread of Christianity, it's important to know how it spread. And initially Rome is going to be hostile to Christianity. And it was the Romans that crucified Jesus. However, later under Roman Emperor Constantine, We'll see that he will convert to Christianity in the 4th century CE and the Edict of Milan from 313 CE allowed for religious toleration for Christians in the Roman Empire. This is a huge step towards the acceptance of Christianity in the Roman Empire. He also provided state support for the religion and under the Roman Empire Christianity received patronage or government support for buildings such as churches. Now in monastic life, this is an important term to be familiar with. This is where one devotes their life to the study of a specific religion. And monasteries begin to develop. And this is, again, where places where people devote their lives to religion. And we see this with nuns in particular. And like Buddhism, which we'll talk more about in the next video, some Christians practice a monastic life. And an example again is nuns and monasteries. All right, jumping over to Islam, we're going to focus on Muhammad's early life. Muhammad was born around 570 CE. By age 30, he was a merchant and was married. In 1610 CE, he received revelations from Allah through the archangel Gabriel. And remember, God in Arabic is Allah. And Muhammad was a prophet of Allah, and he was the final prophet. By 620 CE, people of Mecca began to follow Muhammad. He gathers a pretty strong following. The Quran and Hadith are two terms you should be familiar with. The Quran is the holy book of Islam. It is written text of Muhammad's teachings and is the definitive authority for Islamic religious doctrine and social organization. The Hadith is a series of sayings attributed to Muhammad and descriptions of his deeds throughout his life and many collections emerged centuries after his death. Now jumping over to Muhammad's migration to Medina, Muhammad's teachings ran counter to those in Mecca when he began 
to spread his message. Muhammad stated that Allah was the only God, which was counter to the polytheistic religion that many Arabs practiced during that time. And Muhammad also spoke against idolatry or worshiping of idols. Muhammad fled to Yathrib, which was renamed Medina in 622 CE. Here's present day Medina. And this is known as the Hijra and marks the beginning of the Islamic calendar. Now, the Ummah is another term you should be familiar with. This is when Muhammad organized his followers in Medina into a community. It was called the Ummah. And they followed a legal and social code. And they focused on providing for those less for fortunate, which is one of the five pillars of Islam, which we'll talk more about in a couple minutes. So Muhammad and his followers are going to return to Mecca in 630 he will return and conquer the city of Mecca. He will build mosques and he destroyed all pagan shrines. The only building that survived was the Kaaba, pictured here, this black building. In 632, Muhammad led the first pilgrimage to the Kaaba, known as the Hajj. And this is, again, another one of the five pillars of Islam. So speaking of the five pillars of Islam, here they are. Number one, Muslims must acknowledge Allah as the only God. Muhammad was his prophet. Two, they must pray to Allah while facing Mecca. Three, they must fast during daylight during the month of Ramadan. Four, give alms to the poor, give charity to the poor. And five, make a pilgrimage or hajj to Mecca if financially and physically able to do so once in their lives. So some more key terms you should be familiar with. Sharia is Islamic holy law. It is inspired by the teachings and life of Muhammad. And Dar al-Islam, do me a favor and star this. This is specifically mentioned in the curriculum. This means the home of Islam. And this is countries where Muslims can practice their religion as the ruling sect. In other words, Muslims make up the majority of a country and are free to worship freely in that country. All right, caliphs is an important term that you should be familiar with. So after the death of Muhammad, new Muslim leaders emerged called caliphs. Now they can't be called prophets because again, Muhammad was the final prophet. So these leaders are going to be called caliphs. And a caliph is the head of Islamic community and a religious leader. And the first caliph was Abu Bakr, Muhammad's father-in-law. Now, Shia is a branch of Islam that develops out of the dispute over caliphs. And most Muslims are members of Sunni Islam. And Shia Muslims emerged as a result over the selection of caliphs. Shia supported Ali, who was a close friend and relative of Muhammad and his descendants as caliph. So Shia believed that Ali should be the first caliph and his descendants should follow. He was the cousin and son-in-law of Muhammad, and he eventually served as the fourth caliph. So the Shia-Sunni split is still evident in the world today, particularly in the Middle East. Shia are often associated with the country of Iran. So the expansion of Islam, if you look at this map here, we'll see that Islam is going to spread from present-day Saudi Arabia throughout the Middle East and into Africa and, and parts of Europe as well. So Islamic armies expanded beyond Arabia after Muhammad's death. From 633 to 637, they are going to conquer Byzantine Syria, Palestine, and Mesopotamia. In the 640s, they will conquer Egypt. In 711 to 718, they will conquer Northwest Africa in the Iberian Peninsula. And merchants, which we'll talk about more in coming videos, will help spread Islam to Asia. We're going to see an enormous amount of people in Asia practice Islam as a result of the religion being brought there by merchants. So you should be familiar with the Abbasid dynasty. This is an Islamic dynasty that is very powerful in early AP world modern history. Abu al Abbas was the descendant of Muhammad's uncle and he led a rebellion against the previous Umayyad dynasty and helped overthrow them. And the Abbasids ruled until 1258 CE when they were defeated by the Mongols, which we'll talk about in unit number two. Now their administration or how the government was run was by rulers built capital cities and made policies. And then they instituted regional governors who then ruled territories. Baghdad in present-day Iraq was built as the capital of the Abbasid dynasty. And this city was surrounded by three walls to help protect the city from invasion. The ulama 
are those with religious knowledge and the Qadis or judges helped settle disputes in the Abbasid Empire. Jumping over to Haran al-Rashid, he was a caliph under the Abbasid dynasty from 786 to 809 CE. And under him, Baghdad became a center for banking, commerce, and industry during this time. And then we have the decline of the Abbasid dynasty when governors stopped paying taxes and giving loyalty to the Abbasid Empire. So we have some attacks on the Abbasid Empire. Four groups are going to attack and weaken the Abbasid Empire. And this will occur in the 12th and 13th centuries. The first one will be the Melwaks, which is a Turkic group that took control of Egypt and spread across North Africa. Next, we have the Seljuk Turks from Central Asia, and they took over Baghdad in present-day Iraq. And the leader was titled Sultan, and he reduced the power of the Caliphs. We have these external groups that are weakening the Abbasid Empire. During the Crusades, the Seljuk Turks limited access to Jerusalem, and this helped lead to the Crusades. And then finally, in 1258, when we get to the Mongols, we'll talk about them kicking the Seljuks out of Baghdad. All right, jumping over to Islam in Europe, the Umayyad dynasty, prior to the Basids, they expanded into North Africa and Spain in 711, and Cordoba in Spain was named the capital. The Battle of Tours from 732 was an important turning point in world history in which Muslim forces were defeated by Frankish forces, and this limited the expansion of Islam in Western Europe. So this is why we don't really see Islam spread to Western Europe, rather it stays to Africa and the Middle East. The Umayyads in Spain promoted trade with Asia, and they had Islamic architecture that is still seen today. And Cordoba, as I mentioned earlier, was a massive center for learning in Europe. And Ibn Rushdi was a famous scholar that wrote on law, philosophy, and other topics. Jumping over to Islamic culture, universities developed in Cordoba, Cairo in Egypt, and Bukhara in Uzbekistan. Islamic scholars translated Greek classics into Arabic. They helped preserve some of these Greek classics, such as Aristotle and others. And they also introduced the number system from India. So they made tremendous contributions to history and education. Sufism is something you should be familiar with. As Islam spread, it changed like other religions, such as Buddhism and Christianity. And Sufis are people who are Muslims that seek to unite with God through Muhammad, rituals, and chants. And they're going to focus on introspection, which means looking inward, as opposed to understanding through learning. So this is a very personal experience for Sufi Muslims. So Muslim innovations and transfers you should be familiar with during the Islamic Golden Age, which we just talked about. We have advancements in math, literature, and science. Again, the preservation of Greek classics that were translated into Arabic. The introduction of the number system from India and the concept of zero. And in Baghdad, we have the House of Wisdom under the Basid Caliphate, which was a huge intellectual center for learning in the Middle East. All right, in Africa, we're going to see Islam spread as well, especially in Mali, under the leadership of Mansa Musa, one of the wealthiest people to ever live. He will make a pilgrimage to Mecca, or the Hajj, in 1324. He'll bring 100 camels, thousands of people, and in a, just an obscene amount of gold. He was spreading gold and giving gold basically to everybody he came across. So much gold that there was actually inflation in prices in Alexandria, Egypt. And after his pilgrimage, he established religious schools, he built mosques, and he encouraged religious learning throughout Africa and his empire. All right, well, in this video with a quick recap, characteristics and spread of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Know that. Know the core beliefs of each religion and how it spread. Dar al-Islam, know what that is. The Abbasid Empire and its decline. Be familiar with those four groups that helped weaken the Abbasid Empire. Sufism, what is it? Islamic Golden Age, what were some contributions? And finally, Mansa Musa. All right, guys, look forward to see you back here for video number three, topic 1.3. We're going to focus on Hinduism and Buddhism. I thank you for watching. Best of luck on all your tests, especially the one in May, and have a good day.